that's why I was using the handheld mic instead of this one. The, 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 one of the questions that uh, I have, I wear multiple hats. One of the hats is I'm uh, a member of the Threat Control Authority, a MAFCA. And, and one of the concerns that a MAFCA has is the impact of these extreme events. And so this is going to be directed more towards Arianne and, and Dave, but I would like, I would like to co have you comment on extreme events. And I'm thinking of two types of extreme, extreme events. First of all, the extreme precipitation events, the monsoons that come through and you know, park themselves over Albuquerque and flood us all out. And then the second is the opposite, and, and that's the drought. We're in, in the fourth year of a remarkable drought. And is this attributable to climate change, or is this just natural variability? So with that, I, I'll, I'll throw it open first to uh, Ariane. I guess I get to get this back. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. OK. Um, I don't have much to say about drought. The Corps of Engineers is uh, charged with uh, managing floods in the Rio Grande Basin. Um, droughts don't concern us because uh, flood control is our mandate. Um, the droughts concern the Bureau of Reclamation because their mandate is water supply. Um, we do have a concern about floods and flooding and sort of our big concern is that, yes, it's going to get drier, but remember that variation? That variation is going to persist. So even though it gets drier, we still have big flood events. So don't go paving in the arroyos and you know, knocking down all those little flood, flood stopping structures and stuff and, and create uh, bike paths there because we are going to have flood events. And the flood events are likely to be substantial. Um, things like last September are going to continue to occur because they are driven by a variety of forces, some of which will strengthen and some of which will become uh, less frequent under changing climate. So from our point of view, flood control going forward continues to be a very uh, significant issue. Dave, do you want to talk about that? Sure. Um, I, I showed a very quickly a plot of reconstructed Rio Grande stream flow going back for the last 500 years. If, if you want to find real droughts, really big, bad droughts that put the one that we're in to shame, you can find them in there. Um, so uh, there's nothing in the current drought in terms of precipitation deficits that we can clearly say is, is truly unprecedented or hasn't been seen before. So it's within the realm of natural variability in terms of precipitation deficits. What's, what's new, as far as we know, and likely to get newer, <laughs> is, is, is that the droughts are happening as temperatures go up. And so those temperature increases um, exacerbate the effects of prolonged dry conditions. And, and so even if we're not in an unprecedented precipitation deficit, we are getting into record stream flow deficits that have not been measured in part because the temperatures are warmer now than they were during past precipitation deficits. Um, so, so we don't need to blame everything that happens on, on long-term climate change. As, as the more we learn about past climates, the, the more we learn about the extraordinary range of natural variability that um, exists and, and that people haven't always encountered simply because we haven't been around to measure things for very long. Um, but the effects of increasing temperature, which, which as far as we know, is going to be a one-way street for the foreseeable future, will make the dry periods um, more challenging. Yeah, I'd like to just comment on that. We talked about uh, hundred-year events, hundred-year storm, something like that. Hundred-year storm in Albuquerque, six hours to hundred-year storm is about three inches of rain. The climate scientists, not these two, but others, tell us that the probable maximum precipitation is 17 inches of rain. So when that happens, I want to be here. <laughs> but, but in a high yeah. elevation. Right. Right. In Albuquerque. Yeah. So I, I want to add that um, 
if you look at the climate change data that Thomas Swetnam out of Arizona has produced, we often show our students in the university um, the same sort of graph that Dave Gutzler had that um, really this is, this is average, our drought right now. We're still um, right in the average and what's not calculated into that, not only a temperature, but are the demands on the water. So historically, we haven't had the sort of population here, not only taking away water from the river, but also taking water out of the ground. We're pumping the aquifer, and that has that um, compounded impact on what we're gonna be looking at. Just to compound that too, the way we built our urban environment is basically not letting a lot of that moisture infiltrate and recharge. Uh, until recently, we, we know we're paying top dollar now to re-inject water into the groundwater. But the way we built uh, our hardscape has also added to the dryness. Okay, good. Let me go on to my second question. Uh, and, and, and again, I, I, this is not exactly in the expertise that the panel has, but you guys are closer to it than my, many of us. And that is, are there any strategies that have been proposed that may mitigate the impacts of climate change, such as at least the human-caused part of climate change, such as carbon sequestration, uh, uh, alternative energy sources, cap and trade, things like that? Or uh, Let me ask that one of Dave first because he's uh, closer to it than most. If, if you mean internationally. I do. Um, the, the one word answer is no. Um, so if, if the IPCC is correct and that um, the principal f radiative forcing for climate is now increasing greenhouse gases, uh, I emissions are, are just going up. Um, so I don't know what else is there to say. Uh, we, we, there are schemes that have been proposed, but none of them have been implemented that have any kind of broad scale um, effect on, on emissions. I'd like to add one thing to think about. Um, greenhouse gases persist in the environment for a really long time. So when you look at curves that show future warning, warming, you have to understand that the gases in the atmosphere today are responsible for much of the warming through 2040. So if you're talking about if we shut off all the greenhouse gases that humans emit today, we would still continue to warm for the next 20 or 30 years before that warming began to plateau. So what we're doing today is a gift we give, so to speak, to future generations. So if we mitigate today, it, the effect will be felt tomorrow. And that makes it very difficult to get people to act because they want to mitigate today and have the benefit today. And I think that's, that's one of the problems or one of the challenges of, of mitigating for climate change. Good. I'd like to direct this next one to uh, Kim. Um, one of the programs that BEMP has been doing is, is a lot of water quality monitoring for a number of years now. And I, I wonder if you have any thoughts about what the impacts that a drier future might have on water quality. Salinity, uh, anthropogenic compounds, uh, nitrogen, etc. Yeah. Um, well, typically, um, when you have less stream flow, and I'm sorry, this is so bright, I'm directing everything <laughs> to the patient over here. Um, you have a decrease in water quality. You have a, a concentration of whatever it is that you're looking at. And certainly one of the things that, that we found um, are the, the high E. coli levels, I mean, far above the both the EPA and NMED recommendations for a primary contact stream. So in the summer, the Albuquerque Reach is, um, definitely has very poor water quality. And, and that will most likely um, get worse. Okay. All right, let's uh, switch to some of these uh, the questions. Uh, this one is directed to Kim, and that is, can, can, can channels be cut into banks 
to allow flows during high water years um, to, to restore the function of the Bosque. Yes, absolutely, and there have been um, a number of projects that have cut in channels or done some sort of bank lowering. Um, one of the issues that has to be acknowledged are the water rights, and anytime you're bringing flows onto the land and hopefully um, involving any sort of restoration of cottonwoods and willows and other native plants, is you have to have um, the water that will be used offset um, with the purchase of water rights. And so for a lot of the projects, that's one of the issues um, that's kind of a roadblock for restoring river function. Yeah, if you're not familiar, there have been a number of uh, channels cut in up towards uh, the town of Bernalillo. And, and, and the Army Corps of Engineers has uh, quite a few um, projects throughout the Albuquerque Reach. Yeah. Uh, this is a I guess this is directed towards uh, Dave. It says a report said that our climate models are too conservative in making future predictions regarding the climate. What's your uh, any thoughts on the conservatism or or adventurousness of the climate models? Well, the, the party line is that we do the best job we can. Um, so, th as as you saw in a number of these graphs, the the range of model variability is is pretty large, and so probably the the, the proper way to assess the climate projections is is through uh, a, a risk assessment sort of lens, in which we admit right up front that we don't really know which of the model results or which scenario is the best and consider a pretty large range of variability within the model runs. And, and uh, you know, as, as Ariane showed, you know, the, the, the plots that they produced have big envelopes of variability. So there are ways that uh, one, I mean, I, I could stand here and sit here and argue that both ways, because I can think of, of ways in which the models may be conservative. They might melt ice sheets too slowly, for example. And I can think of other ways where the models could potentially overestimate climate change by overestimating feedbacks. I mean, take my class and you, you know, lear learn all about this stuff. So, um, so, so I, I'm, I'm not sure they're they're totally conservative. I, I certainly hope not. You know. Um, but but they they do produce a pretty big range of variability. There's no one right answer that we can pinpoint for what climate will be 50 years or 100 years from now. And and, and if you have have seen the report that Arianne and the Bureau of Reclamation did, that with the graphs with the variability, the purpose of using multiple models was trying to eliminate that, and they're looking for general agreement, and uh, that is one way of dealing with that uncertainty. Pick a question that we can answer in a positive way. <laughs> okay, this one. Uh, how far north should we move? <laughs> Depends what you want. I mean, uh, you know, plenty of people like living in. You know, I said Al Albuquerque's climate might turn us into El Paso, and you know, I, I have friends in El Paso. People like it there. So, uh, um, if you want precip. Um, remember that the graphs I showed, you know, overall global precipitation increases in a warmer climate, which is what you would expect. And, and by the time you get up toward the Canadian border and, and along there, then precip rates go up. And, you know, the winters aren't as severe in Alberta. And so, um, you know, some people might like that. But <laughs> <laughs> My guess is if you lived in northern Siberia, climate change. <laughs> there was I have heard Russian scientists say, bring it on. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There was a uh, cartoon years ago, a little old lady in Vermont out there in the snow with a spray can saying, now I can do something about those cold winters, <laughs> spraying aerosols. It's kind of a different thing. Maceo, what are possibilities for economically disadvantaged communities in Albuquerque and nearby to participate in restoration as uh, presumably as jobs and economic development? Well, I mean, that's, we're trying to make those opportunities a reality. And I think a, a lot of agencies that have, uh, agency folks like myself um, that have uh, access to land, access to resources, I mean, we have sometimes uh, electric uh, monitoring equipment that never gets used. Um, these things can be put to use in schools, and I think 
the more this this light is very bright. The the more that um, that we're encouraged, and I think uh, the doors opened, like the America's Great Outdoors initiative to do this. I think we'll, we'll think of creative things to do. But every school has a school ground. And I think one of the things that dawned on to me is that every school should have a, a classroom, an outdoor classroom, or a garden. It's high noon. It, it, yeah. And so whoever wants to work on that issue, thank you, John. I was getting a suntan on my left hand, left side of my face. Could you bring the house lights up? Sorry about the video, but I'm not here yet. That's okay. But I think, yeah, if you, if you want to work on that issue or you are working on that issue to bring every school in Albuquerque and New Mexico an outdoor classroom, please see me after. That's my plug. There you go. Good question for the panel. What would be the most important activities that could be done in Albuquerque? I think they're talking locally to uh, mitigate the effects of climate change on the Bosque. Here's your call to action, Kim. Right. So uh, again, my plug um, every time I give a talk lately, and certainly in my class, is really working to restore the mosaic and having not just the idea that we can replace all of the old senescing cottonwoods with more cottonwoods that may or may not do well, um, but allowing there to be that variety of habitats, the grassy meadows, the wet meadows, that really will um, not become a fire hazard when the river goes dry, um, and will be able to expand when, when we do have the storm events. Um, and they will, they will shrink down in the really dry years, but they will allow more resilience and more sustainability in this ecosystem. And they act as that refuge. So um, where you have the, the nice grassy areas, you know, it's a little bit cooler and it's a, a refuge not only as far as temperatures are concerned, but for all the critters that are trying to survive out there as well. I'd just say that maintaining flows is, is, is going to be a huge challenge for us, given all the projections we've seen. But, but there, I, I, as, as someone who's not an in, uh, a hydrologic engineer, but I think that we have got to figure out ways to do that. And, and that may mean changing water laws and recognizing formally the benefits of in-stream flows. And, and I don't have all the answers for how to do that, but I think that's going to be at the heart of our strategy for keeping a thriving bosque and, and a thriving society here um, as the century proceeds. Uh, Go ahead, Sam. Uh, you know, well, um, <laughs> the, the continuing expansion of development on the west side, um, on, on the east side, but the water has to come from somewhere, and we need to think about how sustainable this ecosystem is going to be, how sustainable the cities are going to be if um, we continue to develop and have to allocate more water to more people, where is that water going to come from? And eventually, as our aquifers start to dry, the river will feed that. It's, it's not like they're separate, they're connected. So as we drain the aquifers, the shallow aquifer will feed the deep aquifer, and the river will feed the shallow aquifer. So it's all connected. We cannot continue to pretend that these are, are separate issues. Let, let me uh, kind of put that in perspective. In the middle of your grand, urban development, urban uh, water use is about 10, maybe 12 percent of the total consumptive water use from Santa Fe to Elephant Butte. Riparian evapotranspiration is just about the same amount. So you know, you've got to balance. They, they just okayed 90,000 new homes on the west side, and so there was plenty of water. I, so that, that balance is going to shift. I think it's also not just the a quantity of houses, but how we build and how we use water. Uh, we all need water. Um, 
but it's how we use it. And I think, you know, personally, there's things that we can all do in this room uh, to mitigate and to reduce the amount of water. I think gray water and mulch is the, the, the if I had more kids, that's what I would name them. <laughs> gray water and mulch. I hate to be called mulch, but she's a big. Uh, last thing I, I think is important to point out, um, I'm not a fan of, of, of uh, top-down solutions, but your elected officials at the, not elected officials, but, but the staff of elected officials, the federal employees and the state employees and the Mr. Cog employees are taking a first stab at this notion of how can we adjust development within the middle Rio Grande to help uh, mitigate against climate change, and that's the Central New Mexico scenario planning project that Mr. Cog is spearheading. So information from that will be available through Mr. Cog, and I urge you guys to um, be aware of that and uh, to keep track of what uh, kinds of things they're thinking of and maybe have some input on those documents as they come out. It'll be very valuable. For Dr. Gutzler, as much as climate change scares me, talk of geoengineering scares me even more. This kind of goes back to the, the, the question I asked. Um, are you afraid, afraid, are you frightened by geoengineering? Hope, both as a scientist who is very, I, I guess I am afraid of inadvertent consequences and I would very much I uh, hate to see some big scale, you know, deliberate disruption take place uh, before we understand it much better, and I'm not at all certain we would understand it much better anytime soon. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think there are many other ways we ought to be thinking about to potentially mitigate climate change without um, carrying out a, a deliberate experiment to counteract the inadvertent experiment we've already embarked upon. <laughs> as as uh, the climate becomes warmer, this is directed mostly, I think, at Kim, but maybe Maceo and perhaps uh, Dr. Don would have an opinion about this. As, as the climate becomes warmer, we expect the ecology to change, the Chihuahuan deserts moving north, I, I presume. Does, do you or anybody have um, an uh, 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 idea of what the the Bosque ecology might look like a hundred years from now. So I, I think um, one you should probably develop a fondness for elm trees, as that will be um, a likely candidate to to replace some of the cottonwood canopy. It's a canopy tree, and I think. Um, unless we're out there constantly planting the cottonwoods or restoring river function in areas, um, certainly reduce flows and the timing. Um, the monsoon flows that we had, we actually had flooding in some of our bosque sites with those September rainstorms, um, but that timing was um, definitely not helpful for cottonwood and willow germination. So. Um, Again, unless we're actively involved, and, and Cliff Crawford used to comment on a lot of the restoration work in the Bosque and treating it as a garden. And if you're willing to go in and put that effort in, then we have a little bit more control. But otherwise, it, certainly the species that are more able to adapt um, to these new changes aren't going to be the ones that are already adapted to the historic um, driver of flooding. Thank you. Yeah, I, I guess the only thing I would say is it, it would become probably less hospi hospitable to visit. If you look at a lot of the invasive species, Russian knapweed, uh, Russian olive, I don't know why they're all Russian, but um, <laughs> it, they're, they're, they're severe, I mean, there are serious invasive species that basically say, don't touch me. Um, so it, it makes a difficult, uh, if especially if you bring out youth, or anyone for that matter, out to the bosque, they are covered in in uh, burrs and et cetera. So I think it would be less hospitable and aesthetically unpleasing. Um, I think 
there'd be less grasses. I mean, the certification is, is my main concern, where there's complete absence of vegetation. Um, and I'm not sure, how does, I have a, actually a question. Uh, with erosion forces, d is there anything on wind projections, whether the winds are gonna be stronger because of, I guess, the temper temperature differentials? I haven't seen any research on that. Um, sure, and, and, and I don't know the answer. So um, I, could, I could, as professors tend to do, I could expand on that statement for, but well, why don't I just leave it at that? Uh, but I, I, I think of the, I, I, I'm not a biologist, so I think of these thi things very simply, and, and I'm the one that stood up and said that, you know, in terms of temperature and precip, the projections I look at make Albuquerque look like El Paso. So is it unreasonable to say, if, w if you want to know what the Bosque is going to look like, take a look at the Rio Grande in El Paso. I, I, what's wrong with that analogy? <laughs> the, what's wrong with that analogy is that um, the managers down there, I'm not going to name names, but they go down there and they just mow it. Literally, they mow the bosky in between, and there's some reasons for doing that. Sure, but, but if we look at just the natural vegetation that's around there, and there is some left, is, is that not what we should expect um, if the temperature and precipitation regime looks like, gel I mean, looks like a duck kind of? So I think, uh, and uh, my predictions aren't quite as dire. Um, the exotics will still be here. We're not, there's, we're not going to eradicate any of the exotics, and they're doing well. But I think a lot of our natives are still fairly resilient, and the issue will be water and whether or not we have the new boskies that can come up. But certainly, um, a lot of our upland species are, are not that unpleasant, and they're already moving into the bosky areas. And again, if the water table is too low to support phreatophytes, you can still have um, pleasant areas that are not solid Russian olive and, and knapweed. Um, so it's not, I don't think it's completely dire, and I think people can still do a lot to actively manage different areas um, for, what, for what they desire as long as the water is there. Okay, this one's for Kim, it says, and, and, and I know the answer to this. Do you think BEMP research is valid for environmental analysis of the Bosque, and is it being ignored by the managers? Let me, let me give you That's my... That's so loaded. My, well, the w one data set that they have been collecting for four or five years now is the bacterial quality in the river from just south of um, Cochiti all the way down. And, and it turns out during the summer, the bacteria, the E. coli, uh, go through the roof. The standard, the, the, the river standard is 126, and uh, at times above the 550 bridge are 100,000. I mean, there are a thousand times, and these are natural bacteria. It's, this is not an anthropogenic source. And so the question is, is the data being used? And the answer is very much so, at least that data. Uh, well, and absolutely, and I think uh, initially we were very strong as an environmental education program. I mean, we had a waiting list the first year we were a program of teachers that wanted to be involved and get their kids out. And it took about uh, really five years before um, different land managers and agencies started looking at the quality of the data the kids were collecting and saying, yeah, we can, we can use that data. And so, um, and again, it depends on the person in the agency, but um, there have been some changes. And certainly, I kind of cried for years about um, the thick wood chipping at some of the sites and, and what would result. And I know um, that the district, the MRGCD, they certainly looked at um, some of the work that um, has been done and, and have absolutely changed the way they go into a site. Um, the city of Albuquerque looks at um, precipitation data um, and when the boskies are closed, we're still out there collecting data and, and looking at what is the fire hazard. And uh, sometimes I feel that it could be used more, but absolutely I know that um, we have strong partnerships with a lot of our um, agencies. Okay. Does winter rain go to Texas? I think that's meaning 
you know, what's the, what's the uh, effect of the increased evaporative losses from the middle Rio Grande? Does that wind up on the eastern plains? I mean, wh where does the evaporation go? Yeah. I think it goes farther than that for the most part, but I, I haven't tracked it. Um, and, and, and let's be clear, um, when we talk about increased evaporative losses, we're only talking about off open water and vegetated areas, which, which to be fair, that's what we're talking about here, the bosque. For the most part, evaporation goes down in projections of the 21st century. And in fact, in limited data sets, we already see evaporation rates going down, integrated over larger areas, but that's because uh, the surface is getting drier and there's less water to evaporate. But um, you know, once the water gets up into the atmosphere, it's, it's way, it goes a long way. Midwest, East Coast, other you know, <laughs> places that don't need it. <laughs> so the winter storms uh, in Washington, D.C. are yeah. courtesy of us. Okay, um, here's a, this is more a comment um, than a question. Is not human overpopulation the basic overarching problem under all ecological issues? <laughs> It, it certainly contributes. Um, so, so um, I, you know, what, what else is there to say? Um, I, anybody, I mean. Just reading the card. Yeah. <laughs> Conflicting views. Or I'll just uh, briefly put on my archaeological hat and say that this is a problem with really deep time. Um, humans have been interacting with the environment for a very long time. And um, you can look at the pollen record and you can look at the tree ring record and you can see deforestation among the Chacoans in the, the Chaco Mesa area. You can look at uh, an extensive landscape modification among the Maya. Uh, humans have been evolving their landscape for tens of thousands of years. Uh, so we've been a force for a very long time. Not the truth. Uh, I'd like to, I'd like to comment oh. to that. Um, I mean, I, I agree uh, that, uh, uh, you know, we're a natural species, we're part of this earth, and we've modified it much more extensively than probably we ever thought. Now they're finding that a lot of what's quote unquote wilderness areas actually have profound humanity impact. Um, so the whole definition to me of wilderness actually never existed. Um, and I think, uh, to me, it's not an overpopulation problem. I think that's a symptom of the problem. Um, and I, I haven't figured out the research in that area. I think it definitely contributes to the problem, especially where you have limited amount of resources, like in our area water, um, where you have a lot of you know, overpopulation definitely has an impact. But I think it's, in, in looking at the world's problem, I think it's a symptom <coughs> of uh, inequality. It's a, it's a symptom of social uh, breakdown. Um, because if a healthier community, healthier systems, uh, healthier people actually self-regulate their population size, that's my perspective. Um, I'm still trying to be convinced of such, but um, I, don't, I don't think it's the overarching problem because, it, you know, my other question to that is what, what then do we do, right? Do we just implement a, a one-child policy, which would, you know, be pretty uh, dramatic? It, it has been done in China um, with, 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 you know, unthinkable consequences, I think. Um, so to me, it's not just being hopeful, but I actually do believe that it's a symptom, not the actual problem. Okay, this is a long one. I've been putting it off, and I'm not sure that anybody in the panel is really um, the best person to ans answer it, but I'm going to address it or bring it up. The Rio Grande Compact limits consumption in our region. If you, the Rio Grande Compact divides water amongst Colorado, New Mexico, and Texas. State engineer does not count open water evaporation and riparian usage. But that consumption is included in this limit. So the water that flows past the auto gauge up there by Los Alamos to 
determines how much we have to deliver to Texas. And if, however we use it in the middle of Rio Grande is our concern that we don't get special credits for the evaporative losses. As farms are paved over, we lose recharge and water use increases. How will we balance our water budget, um, which is already overdrawn? Anybody want to tackle that one? Well, well I was actually going to uh, make a little uh, plug. One of the comments that um, Lisa Robert makes when uh, one of the authors, the author of the um, Foscoe Biological Management Plan update, she will say quite often um, when I invite her to speak on the water panel in our class that the, the river and the riparian zone weren't at the table when they made the compact. And, and yes, those numbers are not included, but, um, but they absolutely should have been a part of where that water was going and considered all along. And how you balance a budget now, knowing that we have less water, more people, and that should be added back in, the end stream flows and the use for the riparian zone uh, becomes a very complex issue. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think anybody knows really how we're going to make water budgets balance uh, 50 years from now, um, which you could view as a pretty uh, dire statement or you could view as an opportunity. Um, so, and, and we're not alone in this, folks in the Colorado River Basin, and we're an honorary member of the Colorado River Club because of the San Juan Chama project. I mean, we'll all be thinking about how to make uh, early 20th century water law fit 21st century climate and population and groundwater depletion. And there's no obvious way that's going to work. And so the only way it can possibly work is if a lot of people cooperatively and collaboratively have a pretty honest discussion about what needs to change, both legally and socioeconomically, to actually get the laws into conformance with uh, what nature provides us, uh, which looks like it is sort of going down in terms of water supply. So, you know, I don't think there's a real easy answer. But maybe that means we need to uh, think hard and honestly about harder answers. Good. Uh, couple guys, Fred Phillips, M. Hall. Fred Phillips at Mexico Tech, M. Hall at, at UNM, and Mary Black from Arizona wrote a book called Raining in the Rio Grande uh, two years ago. And it makes that point over and over and over again. This is a community dialogue. It must involve the entire state. Uh, no, no, not just the entire state, because we started off talking about interstate compacts, right? So this is not something that's going to be solved within New Mexico alone. I stand corrected. Okay. Yeah, uh, not, not or, or the U.S., right. Okay. Uh, Mexico is at the table, too. Uh, the last two questions are, are to Maceo. And first of all, you, you mentioned a paper that you have published or is in progress, uh, Journal of Sustainable Education or something like that? Sustainability Education. Has that been published? And, and can you give us a citation? At least uh, the year? Uh, is that a question? Or yeah. Uh, meet me after, and I'll give you the citation, or just get you. <laughs> yeah, I'll get your uh, information. I can send it to you. It's a journal of sustainability education, and it's based on the the youth work. So if you use Google Scholar, journal sustainability education, Martinet, you'll find it. Um, yep. A, a, another qu question. Uh, someone brought up Peralta Canyon. I think maybe it was you. Um, why don't you tell us where Peralta Canyon was and or is and, and what happened this summer, this fall? Uh, Peralta Canyon is on the um, uh, Cochiti Pueblo, um, and I was there actually with their wildlife biologists and with some students from the uh, um, Santa Fe Indian School, and they have an outdoor hands-on learning classroom that they're a part of. 
and it was quite remarkable. I've never seen the actual Rio Grande flowing through the bosque. What's unfortunate, I think, is that actually would be a great study um, to see what happens. But I think the Army Corps, and I'm not trying to uh, bash on the Army Corps, but uh, at due to the compact situation, they've, um, I believe, they've uh, diverted, made some diversion channels to allow that flow to continue in the in the channelized section that it that it already has flowed in, uh, flowed through. So. Uh, but I think that was a great opportunity to do a, an analysis on that. If we're going to point fingers at federal agencies, Bureau of Reclamation ran the bulldozer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so <laughs> the Peralta plug is really interesting, and if I can have a minute to, to say something about it. Um, you guys remember the Lost Conscious fire? Wildfires have become larger and much more intense in the last two decades, partly as a result of elevated temperatures, partly as a result of the drought, partly as a result of a century of mismanagement on so many different levels of the Jemez Mountains and other forests in the Southwest. Um, the Peralta Canyon is downstream of one of the more severely burned watersheds uh, from the Lost Conscious Fire, when you severely burn a watershed, when you get an, a, a severe high intensity burn in a watershed, you not only um, burn all the trees and all the undergrowth out, you also vaporize the organic matter in the soil and you kind of make the soil hydrophobic. So when it rains, not only does it run off, it runs off like it's pavement. So with the September 2013 rain event, now uh, I should point out that the Corps of Engineers has been working with Cochiti and also with Santa Clara Pueblo and a lot of other places in the Southwest as a result of the Lost Conscious Burn to help them deal with this altered flood condition. We work with Lanel, uh, uh, not Lanel, but uh, Bandelier uh, and question. so forth. And uh, Reclamation and BIA has also been involved in FEMA as well. In the Peralta Canyon case, we had a huge precipitation event in the headwaters area. It flushed sediment down off the burn scar in very high quantity, and it effectively plugged the Rio Grande, forcing the entire volume of the river out of its bank onto the floodplain and up against a spoil bank levee that I think it's a reclamation spoil bank levee. Spoil banks are not engineered, which means that they don't withstand having the full force of the Rio Grande up against them for any length of time. Um, we also had the federal sequestration, which really made it difficult to get out there and help Cochiti uh, look at this uh, spoil bank, which if it broke would flood Cochiti. The other issue is that um, Cochiti is op Cochiti Reservoir is op operated excuse me, is operated as a flood control structure on the Rio Grande. It is not water supply or water storage. And there is a downstream safe channel capacity that has to be met by this uh, flood control device. The blocked Rio Grande at Peralta meant that we could not pass floods down the Rio Grande like we need to. So as much as we were all excited that the Bosque was being flooded like it should be, there were all these other constraints that meant that, in fact, the Bosque couldn't stay being flooded. So Reclamation dug a pilot channel through this, this uh, basically it's a... Um, and sediment plug. So, no, so, well, it's, it's a... The mouth of the river, there's a... Delta, thank you. The delta at the mouth of the canyon, I'm sorry, my brain is really off. Delta that basically had formed across the mouth of the canyon plugging the Rio Grande, we dug a, Reclamation dug a pilot channel through and allowed the river to re-excavate its channel. And we had a lot of people out monitoring that this was happening in a safe and effective way. And we did this in cooperation with Coach Di Pueblo, who is the landowner and the major interest in that particular section of the river. So if you remember, it was Friday the 13th, September. It's quite a remarkable day. They were predicting floods that were going to overtop the levees in Albuquerque, and it didn't happen. Even John Fleck admitted that the dams functioned like they were supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> one last question, and uh, this is to Masur. How does one get involved in the partners program? Uh, outside of seeing me after the presentation, you can go 
Partners for New Mexico or Partners for Fish and Wildlife uh, New Mexico. You can Google that. Um, and that program will come up. It's it's for non-federal entities, so it could be private landowners, um, <coughs> could be for schools, tribes, any non-federal entity. We can't work on federal land, <laughs> and basically we provide technical and financial assistance to improve wildlife habitat for federal trust species, migratory birds, threatened endangered species, canid species. Uh, but we also have these mandates to work with youth, so that's why th this intersection happened. So yeah, definitely meet me after uh, the meeting, whoever wrote that. Okay. This is the end. Uh, you know, one thing that I, I think that people tend to assume, we see the bosque down there, we think it's just kind of sitting there and nobody's paying any attention to it. But I think you have to agree that we've got, the, as the folks have t tonight have demonstrated, we've got some amazing scientific capabilities in the state and some, I really appreciate their taking the time to come and talk to us. Thank you.